Whether you're moving overseas with your family, relocating employees on assignment, moving your organization's workplace, or transporting and storing high value art or information, logistics in the modern world is complex. Our new podcast brings you expert voices to share insight, discuss trends, and offer practical advice, all with a view to making it simpler for you to live, work, and do business anywhere in the world. March is International Women's Month, a month celebrating, recognising and championing women all over the world. So to mark this significant occasion and cap off a series of activities, we're bringing you a two-part Crowncast special. Hosted by Rima Prabhakar, a panel of women from across Crown's family of businesses discuss how they navigate the modern global workplace. To explain more and get the first episode underway, here's Rima. Wherever you are in the world, Welcome to Crowdcast. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Crowdcast uh, in celebration of Women's Day. I am Reema, your host for this episode, and thank you for joining us today for a thought-provoking conversation on women in the global workplace. We will be exploring various topics related to how women navigate the modern world of work. We will look at issues such as relocation and assignments, cultural differences, career breaks, returning to work, and the changing physical workplace itself. So I'm joined today by three senior women from across Crown's global business footprint who have had a range of experiences to shed light on how they've overcome any challenges, seized opportunities, developed their careers, and much more, but also to share their own experience. So hi all, and thank you for being here today. I thought we would begin by briefly introducing ourselves. So a little bit about our career backgrounds and perhaps from where in the world um, you're joining us today. I'll go first. I'm Reema, and I work in the group communications team at Crown based in London. My role involves uh, managing the group uh, world, uh, the group brand, Crown Worldwide Group Brand, both internally and externally. For Crown, my career background has been in communications and marketing, and I have lived and worked both in India and the UK. Uh, And um, I have experience in sectors like banking, media and entertainment, local government, and now in logistics with Crown. So, um, Joe, I'll come to you. Would you like to go first? Sure. Thank you. Nice to meet you and nice to meet everybody on the on the podcast today. Um, So I've been in training pretty much my entire career and I currently lead Crown's business unit that develops and delivers intercultural training, language training and partner support programs. Um, I've been doing it more years than I'm going to admit to anywhere public like this forum. But for 20 years, I've been doing it for the global mobility business. And today I'm joining you from Chicago, having relocated myself. Thank you, Joel. Sherry? Thanks, Rima. Pleasure to be with all of the fantastic women uh, today at Crown. Uh, My name is Sherry Leo. I am the group vice president for our moving services division. And my first relocation was actually near where uh, Joe is now. So my family's originally from Taiwan, but we moved to Wisconsin when I was a toddler. And I grew up in the U.S. Midwest. And uh, since then, I've had the pleasure of moving four times with Crown, um, mostly across Asia. And it's been really a wonderful, also very long time in this industry. Uh, Moving is something that has always been part of my sense of adventure and wanting to experience the world. And it's really great to be able to talk about it a bit today. Jackie, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jackie Bird. I head up our workplace consultancy team for Crown Workspace um, in the UK. Um, I'm currently at home today, but I'm normally based out of London. Um, I've been helping people change how they work culturally and physically in this office space for probably too many years, 25 years plus. Um, But it's an area I love Um, and yeah, ever evolving. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Jackie. Let's dive into our first topic of the day uh, and talk about what it's like to relocate as a woman. Uh, Most of us here have just mentioned the different places we've relocated to over the years. 
and moving to a new place is an exciting prospect and at the same time it's a life changing decision so there are several considerations around that so i was just interested and curious to know what were some of your motivations uh, for moving and what has been your experience and did you have any concerns about living and working abroad so jo perhaps i could come to you first yeah so i had always wanted to have an international living and working experience and i had originally tried to secure employment in one or two european countries but that that didn't work out but i'd always had this fascination with with the us um partly because it's so big you know it's so vast and the uk is so small so it felt very unfamiliar but at the same time familiar um i also had a very romanticized notion of it my great aunt was a gi bride and uh, married one of the gi stations near where she was growing up and moved to los angeles so i think i had this really unhealthy romanticized notion of it we always tell the signees in our programs don't just look at the good don't be in the in the you know the dream phase about it but i was um i also made some subconscious decisions to not get married and not have children until i'd had that international experience so i think it was something i was always striving to do um which i think raised my first experience as being a female person relocating and being single was i'm pretty certain that no men get interviewed at the consulate about why they're going to the us as a single woman and was i planning to get married which i thought was you know a highly invasive question and i was not expecting it um but yeah that was my experience when i was when i was relocating a long time ago um and i i'm interested to hear what what jackie and sherry say i think for me the most jarring thing was the ever present thoughts about my personal safety you know i could leave the office mm-hmm. at five o'clock on a friday in the early days of being over here when i didn't have a personal network yet and it was entirely possible that i would not speak to anybody that knew me again until monday morning so everywhere i went was new everywhere i could go i could get lost everyone was a stranger and i really just had to be extremely mindful of my personal security because uh, Chicago is like a lot of major cities you can go from a really good neighborhood to a really bad neighborhood in kind of one street um and so that was something that i think was just quite stressful at the start and that maybe is is more something i felt because i was a female and i was relocating on my own that's so interesting jo because i had the opposite experience almost in the reverse <laughs> i had been coming from washington dc which in the late 90s was very oh, similar yeah. you know one street away from capitol hill it could be a fairly um uh, rough neighborhood and then relocating to um uh, asian cities i actually felt my safety improve <laughs> as a single female because and for the most part um it's actually much safer for women uh whether that was in Hanoi or Taipei or Shanghai my my sense of street smarts actually went down because i i you know i didn't have to be as aware there were, they felt also that there was less um for me to have to worry about in terms of personal safety so i felt that that was a significant life improvement moving abroad That's- That's really interesting <laughs> because I you know we always talk to female assignees in our training programs about being vigilant but maybe we need to refresh some of our uh, some of our content. <laughs> uh so Jackie you moved cities haven't you? I mean you've not moved across yes. country. Yes. No, I haven't had the opportunity to move internationally but I have moved from London down to the west country in Cornwall in the UK and um really the pandemic kind of was the panacea for that for me that i was currently bouncing between the two locations operating my own workplace consultancy this is pre me joining crown um and the opportunity presented itself there was no point in having two offices uh, or two locations to work from and um yeah of all the dreadful things the pandemic brought about there were some good and positive things that that it actually introduced and you know being to to work to work and live where in a place that i love uh was absolutely you know a fantastic opportunity for me but the all important question did you learn to make sourdough bread like everybody else <laughs> no but they do write <laughs> classes in our village so i i'm going to put my name down probably in the summer <laughs> <laughs> when there was sourdough 
for banana bread. I remember banana bread was very big during the COVID years as well. I did um, do a lot of baking during the pandemic. You did. Though, so that was yep. lovely. <laughs> Work from home and bake cakes. That's what Absolutely. we do. <laughs> I've actually, I mean, when I moved from India 15 years ago now, it feels really long time back uh, to the UK, I had um, uh, a different experience. So I, I grew up in Mumbai, which is a major city. So Joe, I had some of the concerns that you had in a new city, but I guess India had prepared me to be street smart and things like that. So when I came to London, it felt very safe. It felt like, you know, I mean, I, I it... A little bit like Sherry, I think you had that experience in Asia, but I had that opposite experience of coming from Asia to Europe and feeling that, uh, you know, I didn't need to be as on guard, you know, that you would feel in, 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 a, in a different big city. So that was my experience. And I think um, some of the other concerns I had when I moved were things like I would be restarting my career in a new country because I moved with my spouse then. And um, uh, so that was a concern I had also, you know, access to affordable and good quality health care because I had that in the, my home country. So, um, you know, I was interested to understand how it works in the UK. It's very different to the way it works back home. So that was another concern I had. And I suppose also finding a good support network in uh, my new country of residence because um, I didn't have any extended family here um, and also uh, the other thing that I thought of and I think Joe you can add a little bit of your perspective here is how to fit in culturally because um, it was there was a lot of it was quite different uh, initially um, I think I was excited at the start obviously because um, I had grown up obviously reading like the rest of us English literature <laughs> So I wanted to come and, you know, visit all those places that I had read off in my favorite books. That was a huge positive. And I think on the slightly um, negative side would be the food. <laughs> I have to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> but coming from India, and this is, this is, you know, the interpretation of Indian food in the UK 15 years back wasn't as good as it is today. Today it's moved on and it's absolutely, you know, somewhere else. It's really good. But at that point in time... Um, yeah, the first time I walked into an Indian restaurant and had a meal, I was shocked. <laughs> so, so I think those are the sort of cultural things that I experienced initially. Um, Joe, do you have anything to add being someone who trains, uh, you know, assignees as well from a cultural perspective and what to expect? I mean, I could talk about this all day, but I promise <laughs> not to because I'll bore everybody. But um I think there's, the, you know, there's a couple of things you said that were really interesting. One was about your experience because you weren't the, the what we call the lead employee, the lead assignee in that decision. Um, and there was actually a really interesting article in the Financial Times recently about how there is a disproportionate negative impact on the female's career when she mm -hmm. travels with her male partner who's going for another job. But you seem to have managed to kind of navigate a career in the UK and and be pretty successful. So there, there's that. And we talk a lot to to couples about what it means and how how you need to if you're I hate the phrase the trailing sprouts. They used it in that article. But, you know, it it kind of describes yeah. what that person's doing, but how you have to adapt really quickly culturally so that you can build your professional network and build your personal network. Because if you think about it, if you're the assignee, so Sherry, if you're you, and crowns moving you, your life, in some ways, the structure of your life doesn't change that much. Right? You're going from one job to another job. Okay, different office, but you right. probably know a bunch of people that you're gonna be working with. But if you're the partner, you leave everything behind, your job, your friends, your family. And when you land in that host country, you have really nothing and you have to start from scratch. And so we, we do work with um, women about how to quickly navigate the culture so that you can build those professional networks. Um, but yeah, so pre you did a really good job of that, Rima. You managed to get over here and how long did it take you to, to feel comfortable? So you woke up one day and said, I'm okay. Well, I actually enjoyed, uh, you know, um, 
uh, moving to the UK and I had a brilliant experience. So I would highly recommend it to anyone. <laughs> but um, I did have a career break, which we will get to a little bit later in the yeah, um, right. in the chat, which, um, you know, where I, I can talk about this a little bit more. But I think overall, the experience has been great. And just curious, uh, Shari, did you have, did you, can you talk about any challenges that you felt you know, having moved multiple times, it's not just once that you've moved. So you're a bit of a pro now for us. But <laughs> from your perspective, what do you think are, you know, a couple of challenges that uh, women might face when they move? I, yeah, I think my my own moves definitely helped me to empathize with the experience of relocating. Because as Joe says, it's such a makes such a significant impact across every area of your life. And uh, you have to be very resilient. And I think... In the early part of my career, um, traveling on my own <laughs> without family, it was very easy. You know, the decisions I were making were purely my own. So pack two suitcases. Where do you want me to go next? <laughs> that was as, as, as much as it took to get me to move to a different country. Um, but, you know, as I got older and my, you know, family life started to change and I, I had kids, I think it becomes far more complex. My considerations are no longer just about myself. I have to actually put others, my dependents, before for myself. And so I think that my experience is that it becomes a lot harder um, to just relocate. You have to consider everything that just got mentioned, your support structure. Uh, You know, I don't want to be the only one that thrives and, you know, everyone else is just reluctantly pulled along. You know, I really have to think those things through. And so I do think it becomes a lot uh, more difficult for for women to consider relocating um, the further along they you know move in their lives or or their career. Yeah, thank you. I I do agree with all that you've said, and uh, you know, uh, like you've said that maybe these are some of the reasons why studies indicate as well that women form a much smaller percentage of international assignees. In fact, I, you know, I had the chance to go through the 2023 Mercer report uh, on the worldwide survey of international assignment policies and practices. My, that is a word. That's a mouthful, isn't it? That <laughs> title, <laughs> which, which said that women um, make up only 20 percent of international assignees. And I believe that number has hovered around the 15, 20 percent mark for a while. And although this number might vary by industries and countries, um, it does indicate that, like you said, Sherry, women find it harder to relocate for work possibly uh, than men. And uh, I was wondering if I, you know, this question is to anyone in the panel who might like to answer. Uh, why do you think, you know, that reluctance is there? I mean, there are some factors like you've mentioned, life stages, etc. And how can we overcome these challenges? Because we do make the half of the workforce, don't we? So, and there is a great, uh, you know, talent set that's available for companies in their female employees. So do any of you have any thoughts to share on that? I think it's a really interesting question because on the side of the business that I work in, where it's company sponsored relocations, most of the people we're working with are, are middle to senior managers. Um, And so women are not as greatly represented in those roles as A, I think they should be, (laughs) and and B, it's not it's not reflective of the demographics. So I think your your candidate pool is already smaller when you're dealing Mm -hmm. in corporate world mobility. Um, But I think Sherry answered it with her own personal experience. Women tend to be much more hesitant to disrupt their partner's career or disrupt their kids' schooling. They're also disproportionately more likely to be the primary caregiver for any um, elderly family members. And so that kind of creates a lot of additional concerns that might make a a female assignee not take an international experience. And I've been doing this more years than, like I said, I care to remember, but we have not moved that needle on that number in two decades. We mm. just can't seem to to push through it, no matter how much we talk about it. But I have started seeing some companies really make strides in trying to prepare a better pipeline. So we've got one client who says, if you want to be at a director level within our organization, you have to have been on an international assignment. Mm-hmm. To do that, we are going to tap you as a high potential early in your career 
and we're going to give you five years during which time you go on your international assignment. And that's very different than the usual experience of, hey, Jackie, I need you in, in Shanghai in three months, off you pop. You know, it, it's so this this planning, this this career pipelining means that it gives women a lot more chance to take care of everything, you know, and make yeah. sure that they, they've taken care of the family. But I think it's, you know, so it's those two things. It's it's lack of representation in, in senior roles that typically go on assignment. And then mm-hmm. it's a greater concern. That's certainly what I see in the in the kind of company sponsored global mobility world. Is that the same, yeah. Sherry, with people that, that, you know, kind of do their own self-initiated moves? Yeah, I think, you know, people who, you know, primarily self-initiated moves are driven by employment opportunities or wanting to have employment opportunities just in other places. I I love the fact that there are companies who are thinking ahead because I think women by nature are planners. Yes. <laughs> <So> we, <laughs> we like to, you know, um, uh, to sort of see how everything, this decision will fit into, you know, the broader, I guess, trajectory. And you know, modern life has a lot of pressures and I think a lot of women often consider, well, that's like too much rocking the boat. You know, it's hard enough to balance all of the plates and, you know, my my relationship with my partner, children, family. You know, if um, I precipitate something as life changing as an international relocation, the fact would certainly make it a lot easier to make that decision if it was well supported and that you know companies who are thinking about their talent pipeline they're thinking about women in senior positions i think they're very smart um, to think about how to help women think plan ahead so it does make sense so that everyone can see that broader vision within you know the family that there's a place for everyone to get a lot out of the experience and you know ultimately where you know, that might end up, hopefully those things look a lot more positive than on balance, maybe slightly negative or slightly too much to handle. Um, Because I think that that's another load that a lot of women just might not want to bear at a a time when you have a lot of pressure from maybe childcare or or, uh, care for others. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a nice segue into, you know, talking a little bit about Um, you know, related to life stage, one of the things that women often, you know, have in their career more regularly than men is a career break. Now, that could be because of maternity leave. It could be, like you said, for caring responsibilities for other uh, members of the family, whether that's elderly relatives or someone who's, um, you know, uh, suffering from an illness, for instance. Um, So, um, and maybe just to take a sabbatical sometimes, you know, for for following, um, doing something that you want to do that, you know, your work may not have allowed you to do, such as write a book. (laughs) So (laughs) I was wondering, um, you know, when it comes to that piece of um, career break, I think, Jackie, if I come to you at this point, because I know you've taken a sabbatical from work. um, uh, Can you tell us a little bit about that? And what was that like for you? How long it was? And how was it for you to come back to work? Okay. So for a very long time, one of my dreams had been to run and manage my own little shop in the village in Cornwall that I live in. Um, and I guess I had it on the, on, the, on the retirement spectrum to happen, I guess, towards the, the end of my career. Um, the pandemic made that happen a lot quicker. And as I said earlier, we were running a small workplace consultancy ourselves and a very successful one. Um, but the it was almost like a light switch. Somebody turned off the projects overnight when everybody was no longer in the office because a lot of the work that I do is in the physical office environment. Um, and so we kind of put the business on hold during that period, um, but I found myself at a loss to know what to do. And so when the world started to open again, I had the opportunity to open a little little shop and I ran a home and garden shop for the best part of three years um, which I absolutely loved. Um, The first couple of years were great because everybody came to the west country because nobody was traveling abroad. Uh, (laughs) Yeah no one could go anywhere else. (laughs) (laughs) The third year probably not so good because then people started going to travel internationally again and so Um, The footfall wasn't there in the village and then really the reality that I've got bills to pay and this is just about reaching that, you know, 
and some mm. days not. So I had to, you know, I had that reality check where I actually, as much as I've done this and it's been fabulous, um, I really want to return to the corporate world. Uh, and I was very uh, fortunate to be able to do that. I, I advertised the fact I was available for work and Crown were one of the first companies that approached me. So, um, yeah, which is great. And I've, I've come back to corporate world. It has been an adjustment. I can't lie. Mm-hmm. Um, previously to joining Crown, I'd run for sm- I'd worked for small SME businesses. Um, and very early on in my career, I worked for a big shipping firm. And I liken Crown to that environment. It's very corporate. Um, you know, they're great. They look after their client, um, their their staff very, very well. Um, but it can sometimes feel not as responsive as I was used to in my own business. So, um, you know, it, there's, there's good and plus in all things. But it has it has been great to get back into that. And because of the pandemic. The hybrid working is now prevalent. Um, I don't think we'll ever see that change, in honesty. And that has given me the opportunity to to deliver the role that I do. I think if we had gone back five years, then I wouldn't live where I am and apply for the job that I got at Crown. It wouldn't have happened because I didn't think I would have had that level of flexibility that I now enjoy. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what, what happened to me. <laughs> fascinated by that story Jackie (laughs) I think that's amazing that you got to go and live your your what you saw as a post-retirement dream and actually yeah do it when you were still young enough to really enjoy it and then I think sometimes as women we don't follow our dreams we we kind of you know they stay as dreams and we don't do Mm. adventurous things like that so I love that story thank you thank you no it was uh it was really good but I'm glad I did it when I did and I, I've had the opportunity to come back to an industry that I've known and loved for 20 odd years so yeah. Would you do it again in the future Jackie? Is that something that you've you know you're marked for when I you know decide? I think to maybe retire? when I retire because I'm quite um, I'm a crafty person I, I make jewellery and I paint and all of those okay. sorts of things so I think if I were to um, post-retirement if I were to do it as a hobby as opposed to an income something if I didn't need to rely on it then yes (laughs) (laughs) but um yeah it would need to really just be beer money and nothing else (laughs) beer money (laughs) that is a dream isn't it every woman has this dream of having a bookshop and a cafe is what I read (laughs) and it's true for me but um yeah that is the dream isn't it Jackie so thank you for sharing that Sherry Joe have you ever had thoughts of having a sabbatical taking a sabbatical from work and um something you would consider I mean, other than every Monday morning when the alarm goes off. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I really, I know, I, I actually really, really haven't. Which is interesting because I live in the states where you know vacation days are precious, so you get very few of them. Um, and so I would have thought if I if it was going to enter my my thought, it would have would have done so now but no I'm sure Sherry thinks about it every Monday morning too (laughs) you know it has crossed my mind Uh, (laughs) I I think I took maybe a a two-month non-maternity leave sabbatical at one point but between Shanghai and Hong Kong that relocation actually took a little bit of uh, time off and you know I was sort of resetting my thinking around is this what I want to do for the rest of my life, international (laughs) relocations, are there other things, you know, that I should consider? And so that was the time for me to take stock. And I, you know, I decided that, you know, I was really happy with the career path I was on, what I was pursuing, the opportunities uh, at Crown. And since then, you know, it's fit into my life, you know, careers Mm -hmm. are really important to me. And, you know, I think it was challenging when the kids were little, there were lots of times during that time where I thought, you know, I probably needed to think about if I can really possibly juggle it all. And, and I didn't, you know, there are some things that fell apart. (laughs) I'd be perfectly honest. (laughs) So, you know, I can't say that everything's been smooth sailing, but, you know, I've been uh, very much always driven by a feeling of, of uh, self-actualization through work. So absolutely Mm -hmm. would I like more time off? Yes but very much enjoyed my career. 
but we'd like it to be paid. That's what yeah. we really want. More time off, <laughs> but have it be paid. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and if I can pick from what you said, Sherry, about that maternity aspect of it. So for me, um, you know, we we spoke about a little career break earlier, Joe, uh, and I took that break when I moved. Um, uh, and um, for the first year, it was more about, you know, sort of exploring Europe and look, you know, and, and, and discovering the new uh, uh, the country that I had moved to. So exploring UK, et cetera. But eventually um, I uh, I took a break to, you know, spend time and to have a family and to spend time with my daughter. Um, and I think from from my perspective, it was also um there were several considerations when I, you know, when she after she was born and a year later when I was considering of coming back to work, um, uh, I had to actually seriously think about things like childcare because, um, for instance, in the UK, childcare is very expensive. I also had to think about work timings and I how I would balance that. So um, I think I felt almost that it was easier to take a break at that time and pay attention to that part of my life and then uh, come back to work and even when I returned we didn't have flexible working available so readily at that time this was post pan you know pre-pandemic sorry and it meant that I had to sort of stagger my return back to work and even in terms of coming back like you mentioned you briefly mentioned about uh, sometimes it being a bit of a disadvantage if you are a you know a, a, someone who's come into the country with your spouse who's working for instance I felt that you know because for me to come back meant that I was almost starting from scratch so I did feel like I you know it, it set me back a few years in my career and I had to play catch up and to break through in that initial phase to kind of find a job that kind of suited all my requirements because it wasn't just, you know, anything. We had to make sure it worked with the family, et cetera, all of those sorts of things. But I have to say that once you're back into and you've had that breakthrough and you're back into the workforce, then it's a question of, you know, just kind of juggling it like all women do and balancing family life. So I am curious to know how do you all juggle, you know, those two aspects, because that's not... You need to just when you have kids, this is something that, you know, women manage on an everyday basis. It's more of a struggle than a juggle sometimes. And with that, we come to the end of part one of this really interesting conversation on women in the global workplace. Thank you to my wonderful panelists, Joe, Sherry and Jackie for sharing your thoughts and insights with us today. We will continue our discussion on work-life balance in part two of this Crowncast Women's Day special, talking about how we can juggle better to overcome some of the challenges we spoke about in part one, and also to chat about what does the future of work look like for women. I'd like to thank you for tuning in today. I hope this episode helps spark some interesting conversations, and I hope you share it with others. See you in part two.